We talk a lot, we think a lot, we act a lot, and when we can, about what our government does in this country, the things that we know about that our government does in this country. What about the things we don't know about, the things that are done clandestinely in our name? It began big time during World War II with the Office of Strategic Services. That morphed into the CIA in the late 1940s, and ever since then, the CIA has been a twofold agency, both collecting intelligence and making policy on the basis of that intelligence in conjunction with presidential administrations and acting to carry out that policy clandestinely in many cases. From Chile to Cuba, from Sudan to Afghanistan, from Zaire to Indonesia, the footprints and paw prints and fingerprints of the CIA are all over the United States foreign policy. What does this mean for our system of supposedly democratic governance? And what's the CIA up to right now? That's what we're talking about today here on Pacifica Radio's Living Room. Good afternoon. This is Living Room. I'm Larry Bensky. I'll be joined by two experts in the CIA's machinations over the centuries down to today. And we'll be taking your phone calls as well here on Living Room. First, we go to the Pacifica Washington Bureau for a look at today's news headlines with Verna Avery Brown. Hi, Larry. Here's some of what's happening in the news at this hour. Now on airwaves around the nation, the public can hear the voice of Monica Lewinsky. The House Judiciary Committee has released the tapes of the phone conversations secretly recorded by Linda Tripp of her conversations with the former White House intern. The U.S. brokered land for peace deal appears to be going forward. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Palestinian President Yasser Arafat has taken a positive step when Arafat stated Palestinians will resolve through peaceful means final status negotiations. And people around the world are staring up at the night sky to see what's being called the best meteor shower in three decades. The best viewing is said to be in Thailand, where spectators have brought sleeping bags to the highest mountain to see the shooting stars. Later today on the Pacifica Network News, Pacifica News will feature a report from Baghdad on the situation in Iraq. PNN's Don Rush is looking at the tobacco settlement that health groups want to snuff out, and a special report on the historic gathering of former death row prisoners who've been exonerated and freed since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976. Larry? Thanks, Verna. Seems that nothing happens abroad these days without those three letters CIA somehow being attached to it, most recently in the Y River Accords supposedly being put into effect in Israel slash Palestine. The CIA asked for a more active role as peacekeeper agency in that region. Of course, with last weekend's possible bombing of Iraq, the CIA's gathering of intelligence once again came into the headlines, and the possibility that the CIA had asked for and not been given a role in assassinating or otherwise getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Those three letters CIA have come to be synonymous around the world with some of the evil that the United States government is purported to have done. Here at home, their role remains a mystery, as it is internationally, because they are, of course, a clandestine service and always find some way to hide what it is they've done or purportedly done from prying eyes. Today, we'll try to pry open a little bit of that secrecy with two experts who've been following the CIA and clandestine government in the United States for years. They join us from Pacifica Station WP. PFW in Washington. In our studios there are, first of all, Peter Kornblum, who is a senior research analyst for the National Security Archives. That is a private research library started back around Iran-Contra time. Peter Kornblum is editor most recently of uh, a book about the Bay of Pigs declassified documents. And he has, just in the last few days, returned from London, where he was investigating what is going on with the arrest of former Chilean dictator General Augusto Pinochet, who according to um, uh, press reports just a few minutes ago, now has a court date December 2nd uh, to decide whether or not uh, he will be extradited to Spain and perhaps elsewhere. Peter Kornblu has written extensively about the situation in Chile for many years, most recently in the magazine edited by our other guest today, IF Magazine, an investigative magazine from the Media Consortium. Our other guest is Robert Perry. He is, as I said, editor of that publication, but Robert Perry has himself a long and distinguished history in investigating clandestine machinations of the U.S. government, dating back to the mid-1980s when he and then-partner Brian Barger were the first to break what became the Iran-Contra scandal and the role of Oliver North. Uh, both uh, Peter Kornblu and Robert Parry have been guests on Pacifica programs and especially Living Room in the past. Pleasure to welcome both of you back with us again. Thank you, Larry. Great to be here, Larry. Peter, let's start with you and um, where you've just been and what you've been doing. 
Uh, I know you could take up uh, this hour and many other hours reciting the history, which, as I say, you wrote about in the most recent uh, issue of IF magazine, of the Chile coup and the CIA and the United States clandestine operation there back in the early 1970s. But you've just been to London, and before you left, I spoke to you, uh, trying to arrange for you to be on this program, and you said that you thought that the arrest of General Pinochet was one of the most important breakthroughs of the curtain of international secrecy about uh, the kinds of people Pinochet is and the CIA, a period, that's occurred in recent years. Why did you think that, and, and what's the latest going on with this case? I think all the international attention around the arrest of uh, Augusto Pinochet uh, has reopened the issue of the, the U.S. role in, in Chile uh, in, between 1970 and 1973. This was one of the most famous uh, uh, efforts by the CIA, uh, directed uh, by Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, uh, to overthrow a democratically elected government uh, and then to support uh, really a cutthroat, murderous uh, military regime. Uh, we don't know uh, a lot about uh, the history of the CIA's support for General Pinochet and his secret police force, DINA, uh, but because the Spanish courts are trying to extradite uh, General Pinochet, um, they have asked the United States to open uh, the secret archives here uh, on the evidence of uh, Pinochet's atrocities. And there are literally thousands of documents uh, in the CIA files, the Defense Intelligence Agency's files, uh, and the National Security Council's files and, uh, um, uh, that really do chart not only what Pinochet did to his own people, but his acts of international terrorism, and, of course, um, the United States' knowledge and, and role uh, in some of those activities. So here is a, a really an extraordinary opportunity uh, that we now have now with international pressure on the Clinton administration to open these files and not only let Chileans have the evidence that will help uh, convict uh, Pinochet of these crimes, but also allow Americans to know more fully what uh, what our government was doing in those days. Well, Peter Cornblew, I don't know if you'd already left, but I'm sure you've seen it uh, since you got back. There was an article in the New York Times, November 6, by uh, Tim Weiner, who usually covers their uh, intelligence beat, as it were, uh, sending up a kind of a trial balloon from the United States Justice Department and the Clinton administration, saying they're discussing whether to seek the extradition of General Pinochet to the United States in conjunction, of course, with the uh, killing of uh, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat in Washington, D.C., the bomb attack, as well as uh, Charles Horman and Frank Taruji, whom we've talked about over the years in Chile, two Americans who were killed there. And uh, here's a little bit of understatement. Uh, get your comment on it. The New York Times reporter wrote, The move by the Justice Department could open up a can of worms in secret United States government files, a former senior American intelligence officer who served in Chile in the 1970s said. President Nixon, his national security advisor Henry Kissinger, and the CIA were deeply involved in attempts to overthrow the elected Marxist government of Chile, Salvador Allende. The CIA was keenly aware of the murder and torture committed by the Pinochet regime, the retired American intelligence officer said. Now, what's going on here, do you think, Peter Kornblow? Is the Clinton administration really interested in any serious way in getting General Pinochet extradited to the United States and opening up that can of worms? The can of worms is specifically the CIA's relationship to the Chilean secret police, which was created in 1974 uh, and which reported directly and exclusively to General Pinochet and took orders exclusively from General Pinochet. Uh, the Clinton administration, I think, faces uh, the pathology of secrecy in the CIA, uh, which it obviously always, not only in this case, but in Honduras and the Nicaraguan Contra War and, uh, and in Cuba, uh, attempts to uh, to cover up uh, these unseemly uh, and somewhat sordid facts at times, uh, and uh, I think that that is going to be a factor here in the reluctance to to open the files. I think there are other bureaucratic factors as well, and there is a diplomatic concern about events in Chile that are going on right now as that country tries to grapple with a, with a past that has now been kind of raised to the surface of society by the uh, arrest of General Pinochet in London. Um, but those are the barriers that we have to overcome and that Bob Perry has done so much over the years to, to overcome uh, to, to, to really uh, uncork uh, these secrets and, uh, and get them out. Well, Bob Perry, uh, talk for a minute about the kind of work that you do because uh, here we run up against the nut of the problem, or at least one of them. Uh, the more that reporters and investigators like you and Peter Kornblue get close to things like what happened in Chile in the early 1970s, or what was going on in Central America in the mid-1980s as far as uh, illegal weapons and drug operations were going, 
uh, the more you run into the skeletons and sometimes the stone walls of so-called plausible denial. And the corporate press will always come out and say, well, you didn't prove it. You don't have the documents to prove it. On the other hand, you can file Freedom of Information Act requests from now until the time that our grandchildren are old and be sure you still won't get the documents you needed. So how do you keep at it and and try to break through that uh, both official governmental uh, conspiracy of silence, I think we can call it, and the corporate press's complicity with it? Well, I think there are some uh, ways you get through it, and Peter and uh, others have done a good job in terms of keeping the pressure on, trying to get documents. Sometimes documents come out. When I was working with the AP and then with Newsweek and then with PBS, we had a certain amount of success in getting out documents when we we went for them. Um, There were also people in the government who are honest who will tell you what's going on often, sometimes for their own interests, but uh, you can often find out whether it is true or not. So reporters play a very important role, and so do uh, various uh, investigators or, and, and academics who, who press these, uh, the, the edges of these envelopes. Uh, but we've seen other cases where, uh, for instance, with the Contra drug operations that where, where the CIA in, in, in October came out with a fairly honest and reasonably complete report about its own knowledge of these crimes. It was perhaps the most direct and serious admission I've ever read by any U.S. government agency about major crimes that it was implicated in. Uh, the problem was that the mainstream news media chose to essentially ignore the findings. There you go. And to, <laughs> and to ignore the content. Right. You know, and one reason that I've been publishing a IF magazine and, and doing the consortium on the Internet has been to find a, a way to, uh, an outlet to put out this kind of information on a consistent basis. Uh, and much of what we've been doing, and Peter's story this, in this issue fits into that, we've been looking at how this whole process evolved. Uh, in a sense, the Chilean coup was important in another way, because in 1973, with the overthrow of the Allende government in Chile, we saw the beginnings of a, of a chain of events that went through um, Argentina in 76, uh, Bolivia in 1980, and then almost seamlessly, almost directly through those events, we saw the development of the Contra movement in Central America. The Argentines, who essentially were the Argentine intelligence services, who were essentially helped out by Pinochet and inspired by him, when they seized control of Argentina in 76 and begin their their so-called disappearances of many of, of, of their victims on a larger scale than Pinochet even, they then move on to help overthrow the Bolivian government. We see the influx then of, of much of the drug money into this process. Uh, those, those characters then move on to Honduras, where they begin training and working with the, um, with the Contras. So the Contra formation, which the CIA also is, of course, involved in, uh, is tied into this whole process of what we were seeing coming out of the early 70s through the mid-70s into the 80s. By the time we get to the early to mid-80s, the U.S. government is deeply implicated in all of this. Um, and the reason, as the CIA report now describes, is that the, the CIA officers in the field were instructed to make the Contras be functional as an army. They, they set aside concerns about drug trafficking, and they acknowledged that in this report. Uh, and they were doing what they felt the folks back at Langley, particularly William Casey, the director, and some others, wanted. So you see, you see this kind of evolution of U.S. foreign policy uh, into some of the dirtiest aspects, the most scandalous aspects of of, of what um, the U.S. government has perhaps ever been involved in, even to the, the point of, of massive shipments of drugs into the United States in and around the Contra operations, which has now been admitted by the CIA. Well, let me ask both of you then, what about the latest trial balloon that uh, went up, or one of the latest around the time of the uh, so-called Y River Report, r- Accords about the Middle East and Israel and Palestine, where it was uh, prominently featured in descriptions of the reports of that conference that the CIA would have a major role as a so-called peacekeeper in that region. What does either or both of you make of that? Well, I have to say, Larry, that uh, the CIA, much like the Pentagon, has been fishing around for a, a new role, a new mission in the aftermath of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, I think most of your listeners would assume that the budget uh, for the intelligence community would go down 
uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, our greatest enemy, uh, and that that money might actually be funneled into a, some more productive uh, avenues uh, for American society. But, um, in fact, the, the intelligence budget's just gone up uh, by $5 billion, from approximately $25, uh, $24 billion to $29 billion. Uh, and one of the ways the agency tries to justify that is to move itself into uh, other avenues, including uh, this role uh, in, in the Middle East. To some de- degree, though, uh, Larry, this was not entirely a break with the past. The, the, the CIA has had a long role as a secret diplomatic entity. It's, you, know, you, you mentioned the two roles of the agency. In fact, there were three. And the third part of what the agency did, especially in the Middle East, was to serve as sort of the backdoor uh, diplomatic channel. We saw the case of, of, uh, of uh, in, uh, in the early days when the Carter administration was dealing secretly with the PLO and trying to develop um, avenues into the Middle East to help settle some of those conflicts. Uh, it was the CIA, particularly Robert Ames, who, was, um, uh, who died later in a bombing in Beirut, who played a key role in advancing some of those contacts. So you did have that role for the agency, um, which you know, some people might consider one of its more constructive uh, aspects. Uh, but obviously now the agency, as Peter says, is looking for new, uh, new assignments and trying to put its hand up whenever it can, uh, when, especially when there's money around to, to support operations. Well, what is there in their past operations that indicates, uh, leaving aside even the question of how we're supposed to run government in this country, you know, open covenants openly arrived at and democratic processes and hearings and votes and documents and all those things that we don't get when the CIA implements or helps make policy. Uh, Leaving aside that question, what is there in the agency's past that indicates that we can trust them in any kind of peacekeeper role to do anything but empire build their own agency? Well, probably not much. I think they, I think all bureaucracies will try to survive and build on themselves. Uh, they are like living entities and to some degree. They have a, and there are a lot of people involved. Uh, there are mortgages and there are college tuitions and private schools and all the rest of it. So, so any agency, whether it be the CIA or any other, will try to protect its turf and try to expand that turf. And I think we're going to see that with the CIA. The, the problem with the agency has always been the component of secrecy that factors into it. Um, and while some of that may be necessary, what we've, we've seen over the past 50 years now is that often mistakes are covered up uh, actions that are highly anti-democratic are covered up, that whenever you have a situation like this, you're going to see them spread out into other areas. For instance, what we saw in the 80s, uh, the effort to uh, do domestic public diplomacy that was to, to run through the NSC and the State Department, but still, con- but still reporting back to the CIA, operations designed to, s- to control the Washington press corps and to create into what they call perception management. Uh, so these kinds of uh, extra-legal or illegal operations are almost should almost be expected when you have an operation that is so secret. Well, let me bring up something then uh, and get your brief comment on it. We're going to uh, open the phones in about two minutes and get uh, our listeners' participation in this program here on Living Room. Uh, Robert Perry, the final uh, and the cover story in your in your most recent issue of IF Magazine, and we will give people details about how they can uh, get in touch with you and get copies of that, is called The Impeachment Conspiracy. And as uh, you both know and our listeners know, I am notoriously an anti-conspiracist. I uh, poo-poo these things. I think... We have enough real things to worry about without uh, fantasizing about uh, secret governments and secret conspiracies. But uh, I need to ask this question here because it's on my mind and I think it's on some listeners' minds. How possible is it that what we are seeing right now in this entire impeachment matter is not only what you write about, Robert Perry, an overt attempt on the part of various right-wing forces to get President Clinton and uh, the people they don't want out of power, how much of it may have a clandestine element in it, too, which involves who knows what agencies, including possibly the CIA? Well, we've seen cases in the past where that does apparently happen. Um, there, there, there have been allegations on the, on the 1980 election of uh, Ronald Reagan, which suggest, and I think there's now more and more evidence supporting it, that, that, K, that William Casey, who was then uh, campaign director for Reagan, was getting information from the CIA, from people at the National Security Council, which he could use for political purposes. There was that component. Uh, what I think we've seen, though, more generally, as we went through the 80s and the, and the sort of the spreading out of these techniques, um, has been that now these are generic. You can use the same kinds of techniques that the CIA use, used in Guatemala or in, in Iran or in uh, Chile or any place else. You can use them domestically. You can use them in the United States. They're not, they're not patented. They're not copyrighted. 
So what you can see are more and more of uh, the political life of this country has taken on in many ways the look of how the CIA runs these propaganda and disinformation operations. And that's a very so frightening th thought, and I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Peter Cornblue, I want your comment on that when we come back after a brief break. We're also going to be opening our phones here on Living Room. Our telephone number is 1-800-958-9008. If anything about clandestine government... <sighs> tickles your fantasies or makes you want to ask questions of these two people who, more than anybody else I've known, have uh, worked to get that type of stuff out into the open, please give us a call here on Living Room. 1-800-958-9008. We'll be back with Peter Cornblue and Robert Perry in 60 seconds. And we're back here live on Living Room. We'll take your calls in a moment. But Peter Cornblow, I just wanted to get your response to that. How far-fetched is it to think that what's going on now is not only, as I think many people have said, and uh, there's certainly evidence to support it, uh, an overt uh, right-wing effort to consolidate their forces uh, behind this impeachment, but also involves clandestine activities? I'll have to eagerly run out and, and get Bob's magazine and read uh, <laughs> what, what, is, what he argues. I think the main you know, problem for the CIA is that, uh, is, is that of uh, a conspiracy of silence, uh, frankly, and a conspiracy to cover up its own history. And, you know, about, uh, I guess, seven years ago, the CIA decided it was going to have an openness campaign where it was going <laughs> to reveal the documents on 11 major covert operations, in, in part to kind of s distance itself from its history, to let the American public know what it had done, and to basically position itself as an agency that could be supported in the kind of role that it's now going to be playing in the Middle East for example. Um, and, we, uh, and of course the agency failed to, uh, to live up to its openness campaign. It now wants the Clinton administration to authorize its concealment of 100 million pages of still classified documents That's on a lot all of pages. these covert operations. Yeah, that is a lot of, it's not only a lot of pages, it's a lot of history that the American public not only has a need to know, but a right to know. I know you study Honduras extensively, and uh, there was an article a little while ago in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago about how the CIA is refusing to give human rights investigators in Honduras the names of Honduran military officers who are suspected of killing people, especially a rebel leader back in 1983. I mean, secrecy is their, is their stock and trade. We're going to go to the phones, but before I do, we've gotten a lot of calls already wanting to know how to get your publication, Robert Perry, and wanting to know more about you. Uh, his publication is called IF Magazine, I as in Isidore, F as in Feinstein, which was IF Stone's name, and also In Fact, an earlier magazine published by George Seldes back in the uh, 40s and 50s. Um, IF Magazine you can get by calling 1-800-738-1802. That's 1-800-738-1802. And he, um, like Larry, many... Excuse I, me, Larry. Yeah. Larry, I think that, that number is a bit wrong. It's uh, It's... It's 1-800-738-1812. Oh, well, then it's wrong in your magazine. You better correct it right on uh -oh. page two. You, if you wonder why you're not getting any subscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me give it out correctly. 1-800-738-1812. 1812. And uh, like a lot of idealists, he uh, sacrifices his own pocket in order to share information because almost every article in this magazine is online. You can get it by going online at consortiumnews.com. That's one word, consortium news.com. Steve in Pacific Palisades, California is our first caller. Thanks for joining us on Living Room, Steve. Yes, thank you. Since the Intelligence, uh, uh, intelligence Oversight Committees in Congress were established, there really has not been a proper oversight method. And I just want to state that unless the National Security Act itself is repealed and rewritten, um, there will be continued abuse of human rights uh, 
you know, worldwide by the CIA and the intelligence community, we have to get to the legal structures which protect these institutions and protect the right, supposed right of the executive to bypass congressional, uh, um, you know, scrutiny and um, bypass the separation of powers. Uh, well, a while back, there was a move to uh, Senator Moynihan and others were making noise, let's abolish the CIA. Yeah, but that doesn't work unless you have a reexamination of the National Security Act itself and the way for the executive branch to do things without any oversight or scrutiny. Of course not, because all they're going to do is shift those activities from the CIA so, so, to the Defense Department. Right, so your effort to obtain documents is moved, especially after the fact. It, unless there's a political movement to repeal the National Security Act, we're wasting our time. Okay, Steve, thanks for that thought. Your thoughts on that, Peter Kornblue? We're wasting our time asking for these documents until we can change the law? Well, I think history is very important to help change uh, the situation with the CIA. Let me give you an example. A brand new book that uh, we've just published called Bay of Pigs Declassified uh, is really the lengthy CIA Inspector General's report on what went wrong at the Bay of Pigs. This report was done in 1961, and it was so scathing uh, that the, uh, the highest officials at the CIA decided to burn all the copies that they could get their hands on and lock the two or three remaining copies away for more than 37 years. And the reason reason, as the internal documents uh, show, uh, is because if this report got into the hands of other executive branch officials and into the hands of Congress and into the unfriendly hands of the American public, there would be a major outcry to abolish CIA covert operations, to take that responsibility away from the CIA, probably to give it to the Pentagon. Um, but that report was, uh, was kept under wraps, and, and the whole history of covert operations as we know them went forward from 1961 onward. All the scandals that we know, the assassination scandals, the Contra war scandals, the Iran-Contra scandal, the Iraq-Gate scandal, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can get those documents out uh, more expeditiously, then you can have a fuller debate, a uh, more uh, informed debate over where the CIA should go. I have to agree with your, your, your caller overall. We have to redefine the National Security Act, and it is likely uh, that unless the covert operations is explicitly taken away from the CIA, that we are going to continue to have these abuses uh, as long as uh, the agency exists. I, I should also say that the results of having this kind of secret government are outlined in a book which our co-guest today uh, wrote called Fooling America. Is that still in print, Bob Perry? No, it's pretty well sold out, but um, we have tried to... Uh, should be in some libraries. But I think on the point that Peter makes, it's, it's, uh, in some ways it's worse than that because what we've seen more recently is that with the Contra Drug Report, which is perhaps as scathing, if not more scathing, than the report on the Bay of Pigs in, in a more profound way in that there were, uh, the CIA knew about it, 50 or so Contra entities and Contras who were involved in drug trafficking. They, they, had, uh, they had a thousand or so cables that, that, was, that provided evidence that had been hidden through the 80s. But here it was being made public, and the Washington Press Corps uh, chose almost uh, across the board to ignore it. Uh, the Washington Post waited 25 days before it wrote any story about this topic. The, the New York Times wrote one a couple days after it came out, but it was buried inside uh, below the fold. Um, you had, uh, in the, I think the L.A. Times, I'm not sure if they've done something yet. So you've had this problem where even when the information comes out, you still need a media that is, that is, that is willing to do it, has the courage to do it, and has the, has the knowledge to do it, and that we don't have right now. Well, we've got it right here on Pacifica, and a lot of us are trying to keep that alive as long as we can, believe me, and I'm really grateful that we've been able over the years to have both of you and others on to talk about this. So we often get people saying to us, we're so glad Pacifica exists, and uh, this is one of the reasons why it does. So let's pat our own selves on the back for once here. Go to Cliff in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us on Living Room Cliff. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Larry. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, now that I hear that uh, there's more money yet going to uh, the intelligence community uh, 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 since the end of the Cold War, and I now have an idea of what happened to uh, at least some part of our so-called peace dividend. Well, that's uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, see, I recall uh, back in the 70s just catching the tail end of an interview on radio of a woman who apparently had special knowledge of the CIA, and she talked about a technique that the CIA use, uses, uh, at least was using then, uh, and she gave it a name, but I don't recall what the name was, but uh, what, what they do is when they want, that is the CIA wants uh, 
uh, Americans to believe something to be true, uh, to be going on in a foreign country. Uh, they plant this information in the, in the newspaper of that newspapers or the media of that, mostly the print media of that country that uh, they want uh, the U.S. to believe to be true. Peter Kornbluth is an example of that uh, in Chile well, in the 1970s. Larry. I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm, I'm trying to say that what happens then is that uh, the U.S. media picks that up right. from the foreign media and then reports it as, in fact, being true. That's exactly what they do. Yeah. Peter Kornbluth did that exactly in Chile in the 1970s. And there's a term mm -hmm. for that. Disinformation. There's a technique called uh, blowback. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it is exactly how you describe it. The CIA had many journalists, uh, particularly foreign journalists, on its payroll. Um, the internal CIA reports, which uh, my organization, the National Security Archive, have posted on our website about Chile and the CIA, um, have this, the, the CIA itself claiming that it planted some 750 stories around the world, black propaganda stories about Salvador Allende's government, uh, and that these stories uh, obviously came back to influence the American press coverage uh, of, of Allende, um, uh, undermining his, uh, his government, bolstering U.S. efforts efforts to overthrow him and, and making General Pinochet, when he came to power, look, uh, look good. Well, what evidence do we have, if any, that that's not still going on? Uh, what evidence do we have when we read an article in the newspaper about Kosovo or Iraq or Indonesia or someplace else where the American public can be assumed not to have a great deal of first-hand knowledge, most of us? Uh, what evidence do we have the CIA still is not buying and paying for foreign journalists uh, and domestic journalists, for that matter, to do their work, Robert Perry? Well, I think you can assume it is happening. The, uh, it's, not, it's, it's often hard to find out that it happened. But in the 1980s, a piece that actually Peter Kornblow and I co-authored for Foreign Policy magazine described how this whole process changed in the 80s. This, in the, what you talked about with the 70s was true. There was this blowback problem, but it got more sophisticated in the 80s where the Reagan administration em, em, employed what they call perception management domestically. And there they built, they created false stories, whether it be yellow rain, uh, chemical warfare in, the, in Asia, or whether it be the Contra, um, some, of the, some of the information about the Sandinistas. And this information was fabricated. It was known to be black propaganda, and it was disseminated internally in the United States. Uh, and, and, the, and the U.S. government very effectively worked with reporters here and intimidated some and, and collaborated with others. So we saw that, uh, that evolve during the 80s. And then we get to the 90s. Most of the press corps has already learned those lessons of how to, how to protect your career, how not to offend this national security establishment. So what we're seeing now is just a lot less questioning um, about these kinds of issues. So in this kind of a climate, it would be very easy to put out a story that might be false about Iraq or any other part of the world and have it not be questioned. By the, by the Washington Press Corps. A deep sigh emerges from within my journalistic being. <laughs> Rich in Santa Monica, California, thanks for joining us on Living Room. Uh, yes, Larry. Uh, do you remember back when uh, John Deutsch uh, showed up out here in the South Central Los Angeles? Uh, I do indeed. High school. I have a tape of that. I was the fellow, the last fellow that got to ask him a question, and I had a series of questions that I wanted to ask him. I was interrupted from doing that from... Uh, some other uh, uh, protester there, but uh, uh, Mr. Deutsch had resigned even before he came out to Los Angeles. Nobody talks about that. But, you know, the thing that I find that we're missing in this whole discussion is we're worried about the CIA and their uh, white budget because it's not a black propaganda or a black anything. It's a white such and so. And uh, when we're looking at what they're doing, the DIA is the one we should be looking at because they can operate within the and do operate within the country. And so my thing is that we must wake up to the fact that we are in a con piracy, not a conspiracy. This is a piracy con that is going on, and the media is playing the biggest role in getting the people to believe certain things. And that, Such as? Well, they, that, that the CIA is going to investigate itself. And we're going to get a report from the CIA where saying that, oh, yes, we, uh, we uh, helped the Contras to, to bring uh, cocaine into Los Angeles. But in fact, Robert Perry is saying that uh, the CIA did investigate itself and did come up with many conclusions damning to the CIA about right, but is the drug agency that just that the media didn't pick it up. Well, the, no, no, the media just is not going to pick it up because if it does, then the, the uh, pharmaceutical money 
and all the uh, the big money that they're getting from these uh, from the petroleum and the petrochemical industry to support to keep their lie in check. You see, this is what I'm saying. This Let's go back to your first point, Rich, because I think it's a very important one. The the budget of the intelligence agencies, right? Altogether, is supposed is supposed to be about twenty seven, twenty eight billion dollars now, right. of which only three billion dollars is supposedly spent by the CIA. But, but the rest spent the by, as you say, budget, Larry. What? Let's look at the DIA budget. The Defense oh, Intelligence Agency. We have no idea how much they it have is. They have eighty five percent of. They have published in in, in 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 I think covert action or one of those uh, organizations uh-huh. have a have where they the Pentagon or Pentagram has published uh, a, a a statistic showing how much money they spend on uh, 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 what do you call it disinformation campaigns and uh, the the all the different propaganda ways of of getting people to believe different things of perceptions management etc right comes to almost eighty five percent of their budget. Well, let's get a comment from our two guests. Rich, uh, thank you on, on that, uh, making that point. Uh, uh, the $27 billion or $28 billion, however much it is, figure Robert Perry and Peter Kornblue, uh, a lot of that goes to the National uh, Reconnaissance Agency, to the National Security Agency, to the Defense Information Agency, and a whole bunch of other agencies about which we don't know a heck of a lot, possibly even less than we know about the CIA. Uh, what's your take about what's happening with all that money, and is some of it being spent domestically to influence policy and propaganda in this country? Well, I think the uh, there are some good things that the agency does, and and other other parts of the U.S. intelligence. The what we've seen, well, actually, what has what has surprised me, and in some way encouraged me in in seeing some of these documents that we're now looking at, uh, is the fact that there were people in the in the analytical division of CIA who were doing a fairly honest job. Um, I, I got to know uh, one of the uh, one of the analysts pretty well, who was uh, handling uh, nonproliferation issues back in the '80s, and and he had been driven out of the CIA because he kept insisting that Pakistan was involved in in moving ahead on on nuclear weapons, and that went against what what the uh, Reagan administration wanted. He also he also argued that the Soviet Union had been less irresponsible on proliferation than the Reagan people wanted to say. So he was effectively he was literally sent to a psychiatrist and told he was unstable. Um, so, so there were people, though, who were heroes inside the CIA and other agencies trying to do an honest job, which was to tell the American people and the policymakers, more, more importantly, more directly for them, the policymakers, what was actually going on. But we saw an overriding of that. Uh, we saw many people purged during that period who were doing decent work. Uh, and so I, I think that it's, it's, it can't be, there can't be a one brush to, uh, to paint everything uh, in the U.S. intelligence communities. There, there has yeah, been but Bob, good... you're talking about one of the aspects, information gathering, people who tried to gather honest information, and in many cases were purged. And there's a Reuters story, I don't know if you've seen it uh, today, out of Hawaii indicating that an analyst has been purged uh, just today for having done what you're talking about. He uh, didn't uh, accord to the CIA's line about China, that China CIA apparently wanted to have a report saying China is about to implode because of ethnic tensions. He studied it, a man named Gary Fuller, and said, no, that's not going to happen. So he lost his CIA contract. You're talking about the information gathering element here. Mm-hmm. What I want to talk about more, and the CIA always falls back on this, and I've been done debates myself with CIA people in various campuses and on the radio. They always want to say, well, our job gathering information, we do this and that. It's a difficult, tough world out there and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes we have successes. And here they are. Uh, I want to talk about their operational aspect. I want to talk about them going around the world, destabilizing governments, planting uh, disinformation, blowback, black propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Uh, All of that kind of stuff that's gone on forever since 1948 or even since the Second World War. And right now, how do we get at that? Can I just pick up on, on the point that your caller was making, Larry, which is that there are other agencies in the intelligence community that conduct covert operations, and there are many agencies uh, in the Defense Department itself, not the DIA, I don't believe, actually, um, but other uh, uh, elements of the Special Forces and, and the Green Berets and the Black Berets, et cetera, who do have uh, major covert operations components. They have remained, for the most part, largely neglected because a lot of our focus over the years has been on CIA covert operations. But this is the cost of secrecy, that we don't know about uh, the other elements of the national security uh, uh, agencies that, that do conduct um, operations around the world that are in our name but are without our knowledge. Uh, we need to have less secrecy 
uh, when it comes to national security operations than we have now. So we can uh, so we can engage in how a di- discussion about how that money is being spent. When we come back with uh, Peter Kornblue of the National Security Archive and Robert Parry of the Consortium and IF Magazine, uh, we're going to ask both of them again to give out their phone numbers and websites. Peter, yours especially, because you mentioned it in passing for the National Security Archive and all the documents you've got posted there for people to uh, point and click around. This is Pacifica Radio's Living Room. We'd like to get some calls from women here in the audience. These are issues that certainly affect all of us, no matter what our ethnicity or gender. Our telephone number, one 800 Nine f- I'll be back in 60 seconds. Our phones are full. We'll be back. We're back here on Living Room. Uh, we're going to ask some guys to step aside so we can get some uh, women's voices here discussing these issues. 1-800-958-9008 is our telephone number. Peter Cornblue, what's the website for National Security Archive? It's www.seas.gwu.edu slash nsar. C H I V E. Okay, I'm going to say that again slowly. www.seas.gwu.edu slash N S A R C H I V, as in National Security Archive without the E on the end. No, no, with the E on the end. Oh, you didn't mention the E, all right, then put the E on N S A R C H I V E on the end. And once again, to get a hold of Robert Perry's uh, organization, the Consortium and IF Magazine, it's uh, www.consortiumnews.com or their telephone number to subscribe or get a sample copy, 1 800 738 1812. You're going to send the next issue to me for proofreading, right, Bob? I will. <laughs> Joe in San Francisco, thanks for your patience. Thanks for joining us on Living Room. Sure. I was wondering if you could comment on the um, CIA's infiltration of the left, you know, both here and internationally. I think, as you know, you know the groups like the SDS were infiltrated. Um, uh, Clinton himself, in fact, is uh, Roger Morris talks about in his book, Partners in, Partners in Powers, rumored to have been a CIA asset while at Oxford. Um, I guess the question... I have is, you know, what effect could this infiltration have had? Well, what effect did it have on the left, and how much could it explain the current ideological incoherence on the left in this country? Oh, I think we do that pretty well by ourselves without being infiltrated by anyone, but your point is well taken. Uh, the infiltration of the left, which is documented uh, many, many times over now uh, during uh, the 60s and 70s and beyond by COINTELPRO and other programs, uh, is there any evidence that the CIA or uh, a government agency like that, other than the FBI, which of course has been documented and having done it, that the CIA was directly contravening its charter and acting domestically, uh, Peter Kornblue or Robert Perry? Well, certainly it was, I think, in the 1980s as well. I mean, much of the COINTELPRO story and the attacks on the on the black civil rights leadership and so forth, that, that goes back uh, further. But in 1980, with a decision to target the Washington Press Corps and to target congressional staff people with the so-called uh, public diplomacy or perception management operations, those were direct interventions by the CIA into uh, domestic policy in the United States in a very direct way. We, we know based on documentary evidence that came out during Iran-Contra that, that reports were being, were being made back to William Casey at the CIA about the progress that these projects were having. And in, indeed, the, it was being run by a, the, the, a, a former top official of CIA disinformation and propaganda named Walter Raymond Jr., who had been moved over to the National Security Council for this purpose. So we saw an effort 
to really directly go after the information base of this country uh, by putting in false information, exaggerated information, propaganda about the issues that the CIA wanted dealt with in a certain way. That was with a more aggressive approach in Central America and, and, in, and with um, arms buildups in, in Europe. So that's what we know for a fact. Um, is that continuing? It's always hard to get to the current moment on these kinds of stories because you do have to rely on certain ruptures of information to figure them out. Well, let me try to bring uh, you up to the current moment a little bit here. What do you make of this? Uh, and this is from a website of the Progressive Review by our friend Sam Smith, whom I think you both know in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's headlined, National Public Radio Chooses Propaganda Czar as Chief Executive Officer. And he writes, in a move roughly akin to the ACLU hiring a CIA director for its president, National Public Radio has named the czar of American broadcast Agitprop as its CEO. Kevin Close is the man in question, K-L-O-S-E. He now coordinates all major American broadcast propaganda, including the Voice of America and Radio Marti, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia. Uh, Kevin Close was president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty from 1992 to 1997. Prior to that, he worked for many years for the Washington Post. Is there any concern that somebody with that kind of background with the United States uh, propaganda missions abroad uh, would become head of something as large as National Public Radio? I think there is some concern, although not because of a kind of clandestine or, 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 or propaganda uh, issues, but more because of uh, a, a career in the, in, the, in the U.S. government um, uh, that uh, uh, it really doesn't lend itself to kind of a, a, a clear vision of what public radio might be about. Uh, I think that the, the agencies that, that, that Mr. Close headed in the 1990s were less tied to, to propagandistic activities per se than, than those agent in the 1990s than those agencies were in the 60s and 70s and 80s at the greater times of, of, the, of the Cold War. And that includes uh, Radio Marti, Peter Kornblum? Well, Radio Marti, I think, is, uh, well, a lot, there's been some effort to change Radio Marti, but yes, I think that's a, a, a good example of, of, uh, of why we should be concerned about this. I'd have to go back and look at whether he made a personal effort to wrest control of Radio Marti away from the anti Castro Cuban exile community that controls it um, and, and what role he actually played in that before I could uh, necessarily say that he was a, a horrible candidate for that reason. What's your take on this, Robert Perry? Cause for concern? Well, sure. I think the um, uh, I've seen personally at, at public broadcasting, uh, where I did some work, that the kinds of pressures that have been placed on uh, all public broadcasting uh, have been intense. The um, the efforts to control the, the CPB, the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, uh, also came out of the 80s in in a very direct way, where where uh, political operatives with very strong ideological positions were placed in those jobs, with the idea of getting control of PBS and influencing the direction of of the programming. And that's how it works. And I saw it personally uh, affect judgments being made inside PBS. So, um, yes, when you have that kind of crossover, you have a, you have a possible problem. And, and, and NPR particularly was targeted during the 80s by the public diplomacy apparatus. There are, there are, there's documentary evidence about efforts to, uh, to pressure uh, NPR to go soft on its coverage of, of Central America, where, where it was doing some very good, courageous, honest reporting about what was happening there. And uh, one of the, the foreign editor who was involved in, in, in those stories was eventually, eventually pressured out of his job. So you have a history of this effort uh, to sort of politicize public broadcasting and make it more ideological and in tune with what uh, these kinds of uh, uh, intelligence agencies might like. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Those who listen to National Public Radio perhaps will be able to detect the difference. Perhaps not. Many people think it's gone too far in the direction it might be going in anyway uh, with that kind of propagandistic orientation. Thomas in San Monica, California, thanks for joining us on Living Room. Hi, uh, thank you. Just wanted to see if you could answer any, uh, give me any information on the following. Did you ever hear anything in the early 80s, late 70s, where uh, William Casey, well, CIA director, uh, was, uh, although he was supposed to keep most of his private holdings in blind trust, did not hold out his Cap Cities stock, which was a pretty considerable amount of stock in Cap Cities, whereupon ABC was, was uh, held its, uh, the government held the FCC license for ABC, where the stock went down, and then Cap Cities went ahead, of course, and as we all know, bought ABC. 
and just wanted to see if you could answer that and see if that has any relevance to what we're talking about, and I'll get off. All right, well, thanks for calling, Thomas. I do remember something about that, Robert Perry, but I can't for the life of me remember what I remember. What, what do you remember? Well, <laughs> I, I wrote those stories for the AP. So there you go. <laughs> the, um, the stories that we did for the Associated Press in the early 80s looked at how Casey had refused to put his holdings in a blind trust. Uh, there were obviously cases where, especially considering some of his oil holdings and so forth, that his knowledge at CIA could have influenced the outcome of some of his stock holdings. Uh, after we did a number of pieces, he finally agreed to, to move at least uh, pretty much all of them into a blind trust. I think there was a provision that he did not want his Cap City stock sold. He was a major investor in Cap City at the time. Um, now, whether that influenced the uh, direction of ABC once Cap City uh, moved into the ABC area, it's hard to say. I, it, it's, uh, those are things we never really quite got to the bottom of. But I think uh, there obviously have to be concerns when you have those kinds of crossovers, which is one reason that people use blind trusts to try to prevent to, or to minimize that kind of problem. Mm. Doug in Long Beach, California, thanks for joining us on Living Room. Larry, thanks, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I want to thank both your guests for coming on the show and your program for bringing such uh, horror stories to light. Thank you. Get much coverage. I think if we really want to understand the implications of the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States media, uh, I'm 36 years old, and not one time has a U.S.-sponsored, supported, trained, or funded dictator, School of the Americas has produced 10 heads of states, by the way, none of them democratically elected, has uh, never been arrested in my lifetime. This is the first. Now, the international community and the, and the press is, you know... How about Noriega? Uh, Noriega wasn't arrested by a, uh, an agency outside of the United States. No oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. No international community has ever re arrested a U.S. dictator. Okay. Um, now, the international media is all over this. Here in the United States, there's a news blackout. I mean, it doesn't even exist. You're talking about Pinochet's media. arrest? I'm sorry. You talk about General Pinochet's arrest? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't call it a news blackout. I mean, it is in the national papers uh, fairly consistently. Peter Kornblut, what do you expect to happen with General Pinochet? Should he be uh, extradited to Spain? Uh, there'll be certainly massive international coverage of that, I would expect. But well, maybe I just I'm came being back naive London. here. <laughs> no, there, there, uh, there was uh, a lot of coverage in, in Britain. There has been uh, some New York Times uh, coverage uh, and sporadic Washington Post coverage. Uh, I don't know, but and a lot of uh, all the wires were there with me sitting in the hearing room in London, Reuters and AP and, uh, and, and all of them. Uh, but um, I think that the Pinochet case, uh, if it goes to extradition, if there's actually a trial in Spain, will certainly be um, uh, a historic event. It already is a historic event. Uh, it is a turning point uh, in the evolution of uh, and the power of human rights law. Uh, and I think it's going to change history as the Chileans know it inside their country. And hopefully if your listeners uh, get on the horn and push for the declassification of documents that can help uh, the case in Spain and that can help the American public know more about our own government's role in Chile, it'll change the history uh, of the CIA as we know it here uh, as well. But there, there's also one interesting point that makes this even more current, and it's the role of George Bush. If you remember, George Bush was the CIA director in 1976, at the time of one of the worst cases of uh, international terrorism in American history. That was the, the bombing that uh, killed uh, Letelier, who was a, an associate of Allende's, uh, and Ronnie Moffat, who was an associate of Letelier's. And that occurred in Washington, D.C., and we now we know, based on the documentary evidence that exists, that the CIA was, was alerted to this problem. Uh, it's never been clear what George Bush did with that information. He has never been willing to talk about it. He's never been pressed to talk about it. So I think the, the, the information we would find um, uh, could lead in those directions about what Bush was, was actually doing and knew about these very much, uh, these terrorist operations. And that still remains relevant because his son is, is considered um, a front runner for the next presidency of the United States. And, and if that happens, one can assume that the father will be back, in, back helping to run foreign policy. So I think it's the kind of question that is not just historical, but has real currency and possibly even effects on the future. Robert Perry and Peter Kornblow, a caller called who didn't want to be on the air but wanted to ask this question, and it's relevant to what we're going to be, very relevant to what we're going to be talking about tomorrow here on Living Room. Tomorrow, as uh, you probably both know, is the 20th anniversary of the uh, tragedy at Jonestown in Guyana. And ever since that event, and indeed before it, 
Uh, there were many people like myself who covered it at the time as journalists who suspected that there were elements of uh, intelligence agency involvement in that on one basis or another. Some people think the whole thing was set up by the CIA. Um, Jim Jones calling himself a revolutionary socialist, uh, running around the world with tens of millions of dollars, bringing his uh, multiracial group. Excuse uh, me, African-American. Larry, but didn't you say you weren't a subscribe to conspiracy <laughs> theories? I want to get your take on this. I'm just telling you what some people have said over the years about this, and we're going to be dealing with this tomorrow, especially with a reporter who spent four or five years investigating this. He'll be one of our guests tomorrow. But what does either of you know about that particular uh, tragedy? And the, and the Central Intelligence Agency's possible involvement. I know very little about it. Uh, Peter, you know Perry. anything about Guyana? and uh... Uh, The CIA was involved in Guyana in the early 60s. We overthrew a government there. They were ordered by John Kennedy to overthrow the government of Chetty Jagan. They did so. Uh, the, the CIA has covered up the historical record of that particular covert operation. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I just would say that, that that's an avenue that, uh, that is unlikely to bear fruit um, uh, in terms of a, a role of, of some secret agency of the United States government in that, in that whole episode. There may have been intelligence reporting on it after it took place, uh, which would be worth going after under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, but I would, I would hesitate to, to find, lend any credence to, to those conspiracy theories. I, I do have a suggestion for your readers. Um, because even though this is very difficult to, to get the history out, in the last few months, um, some key documents really have uh, gotten on the public record that are available for, for your listeners to read. And I think they'll give them a really good sense of the CIA's history and what the debate should be about now. Okay. We have three separate inspector general's reports, all done inside the CIA. Now, that does cast some problems on their credibility, but still they're worth reading. We have the CIA inspector report on the inspector general's report on the Bay of Pigs invasion, which is well worth reading, and which I have just published in a book called Bay of Pigs Declassified, published by the New Press. Peter, we when you hear that CIA's music, it means our time's up, so give us the other two quickly. On Honduras and Battalion 316, and we have the CIA's uh, inspector general's report on the Contras and drugs, and this brings us right up to the present, and these are three documents worth reading. And uh, in order to find out more about them, visit those websites that we talked about or just use any search engine on the web for National Security Archive. That is the organization that Peter Kornblu, one of our guests today, uh, works for as a senior analyst. Thank you very much, Peter Kornblu and Robert Perry, for joining us today here on Living Room. Uh, Robert Perry, once again, you can reach him and his magazine. Get copies of it, 1-800-738-1812. We are always ready, willing, and able to hear from you online at livingroom at pacifica.org or 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley, California, 94704. I'm Larry Bensky. Our producer is Cheryl Flowers. Back tomorrow with something completely different here on Living Room. On the next Living Room, we commemorate the 20th anniversary of one of the great tragedies of our century in this country, Jonestown, and the deaths of more than 900 people. We'll speak to a survivor of that incident. We'll speak to a journalist who was involved for years in investigating it and what happened before, during, and after Jonestown. And we'll speak as well with a prominent politician here in San Francisco who analyzes why Jonestown happened. We'll be taking your phone calls as well on the 20th anniversary of the deaths at Jonestown here on Living Room with me, Larry Bensky.